Welcome, everyone, to the Council on Foreign Relations. Thanks for coming on this especially early morning. I hope it'll be a good and sim stimulating start to your day. I'm Tom Jelton from NPR, where I am the religion and belief correspondent, and it's my honor to lead this council meeting today with the Most Reverend Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Reverend Welby is the senior bishop and principal leader of the Church of England and the symbolic head of the worldwide Anglican Communion. He's the 105th in line in that position, going back many hundreds of years. I'm going to be engaging Reverend Welby in conversation for about 30 minutes, and then you'll get your turn to jump in. Uh, one rem reminder, uh, those of you who are regulars here at the council know it's your duty to turn off your cell phones at this point so we're not interrupted. So welcome, Reverend Welby. I'm, thanks for squeezing us in. I know you have a busy schedule and a very short visit here to Washington just for a couple of days. Sad, sadly, yes. <laughs> Uh, maybe you could begin by giving us a sense of the Anglican Communion worldwide, the Episcopal Church here in the U.S., but also around the world. Just give us a sense of the Communion. Uh, the Communion is, has churches in about 165 countries um, with uh, 38 what we call provinces, each headed by a primate of some kind or another, though in the United States uh, it's called a presiding bishop, and in Scotland a primus. I've never quite worked that one out, but there we are. It sounds to me like a camping stove. But that, that's, uh, the primus is uh, very good. It, it does the same, the same role. The, um, the 38 provinces are each uh, autonomous but interdependent. Uh, the Church of England, for historic reasons to do with um, the empire, to do with... Um, the expansion of Christianity through Britain's role in the in mission in um, and foreign missions in the 19th century um, is the sort of where it all started from, and the diocese of Canterbury, the See of Canterbury, as it's called, is the titular centre of the Anglican Communion. The average Anglican is an African woman in her 30s, living in sub-Saharan Africa on less than four dollars a day. Uh, so what you see in this country or in the United Kingdom, um, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, is really the exception. On the whole, to use Pope Francis's phrase, we are a poor church with the poor. That's an amazing statistic. And there's about 80 million of them. 80 million. Roughly. Mm -hmm. And, and so where, uh, that, that is a very important data point. Uh, but where does the, where's the concentration? What's sort of the macro data behind that? Where are your biggest numbers? Where is your membership growing? What are the trends that uh, you see right. underway? Well, it's very typical of many of the traditional historic churches. Um, the mainline uh, churches typically are growing in the global south, and so are we. Mm -hmm and static or shrinking in the global north, and so are we. Um, in the United Kingdom, or in England, because we have four provinces in, in the United Kingdom, England, Scotland, uh, Wales, and Ireland. In England, um, we were at our height in the 1930s, about three and a half million people, and today we're about 1.2 million, a bit more, 1.5 million, depending on how you measure it. Um, and uh, whereas in Nigeria, roughly 17 to 20 million people attend Anglican churches on a regular basis. Now, you say that these provinces, 38 provinces, are autonomous. What exactly does that mean, specifically with relation to your own role as Archbishop of Canterbury? And the symbol what does it mean to be the symbolic head of the Anglican Communion? Well. You probably, some people may know Balfour's um, great saying about the House of Lords in, in the United Kingdom, that uh, the House of Lords has power without responsibility, the privilege of the harlot throughout the ages. And the Archbishop of Canterbury has responsibility without power, which is the privilege <laughs> of the monk throughout the ages. Um, it is a symbolic role. I can't order anyone to do anything. Mm -hmm. So when we gather uh, the primates, which we're hoping to do in January for the first time for four years, 
it's an invitation. It's not a, an instruction. And if I gave an instruction quite properly, they would ignore it. Um, but that works in England as well. I mean, the, the Archbishop of Canterbury has influence but not power. And I think that is the key thing. And the influence depends on a mixture of spiritual life of, and of um, seeking to work with and build uh, groups focused on particular issues that affect the communion or the Church of England or whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not a personal primacy in the sense that the Pope is. There is no Anglican Pope, right. mm -hmm. nor are there Anglican Cardinals. The primates are not the equivalent of the Cardinals. Mm -hmm. And the way that it works in different countries is, is very different. In many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, when the Archbishop says something, people tend to do what they're told. Um, in England, they consider that an interesting suggestion as a starter for discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so with, with so many of your members, so many of the, the provinces being in the Global South, what challenges does that present to you as the Archbishop? Now, you just mentioned just outside the door here that from here you head basically to Cairo. Um, to what extent does that reflect sort of the way that you structure your work? I mean, is that, is that mission very Structure would be a, an euphemism, <laughs> symbolic to use the word, the word of the morning. Um, I think what it is, it, it's not unique to us, quite the reverse. We are just a type, a paradigm in some ways of the problem that I think most people in this room will be facing. Uh, and this is a theme I've, I've been more and more conscious of over the last year. Um, that if you have a mobile telephone, modern mobile telephone app or an iPhone or something like that, you have the entire world in your hand. All the stuff comes in from Twitter, through the news feeds, through the blogs. It's all there. But there is no personal relationship. So you have variety, diversity, coming at you at a huge rate. In, in an unprecedented rate. Look, in the 19th century, when the divisions in the Anglican Communion were certainly as complicated as they are now, but they took several months to get to you mm -hmm. by ship. Now they come at you in microseconds. And yet you don't have the personal face-to-face -face contact which enables you in the way that through diplomacy, through prayer, through uh, interaction at a human level, through facing, to deal with that diversity. And that's typical of business, of, of diplomacy, of uh, the church, uh, of many, many different, of NGOs, of many, many different areas. So there are two ways. First of all, we have to build structures that enable us to be able to trust each other and not to be drawn into conflict by our structures within any institution, any global institution. And that's a massive challenge. It's a massive challenge for everyone here as, as well as for us. Secondly, you do have to spend time going to see people and sitting down with them and listening with them. So when I'm in Cairo later in the week, I will be sitting listening to some Global South primates who will be quite critical of things I've done. And they may well be right. There's often plenty to be critical of. And I will listen to them. We will pray together. And the diversity is held in personal relationship. But I think that's a common problem in the world today, which we are increasingly struggling to deal with. Uh, you're, you're being quite candid about the s s disagreements uh, or even divisions within the, within the communion. Um, Pope Francis uh, has talked often about, the, he uses the term ideological colonization, mm. uh, referring to the sort of tendency of uh, liberal congregations in the north sort of imposing a, their kind of liberal agenda around social issues on the south. Um, we're all familiar, I think, with what happened here in the Episcopal Church a few years ago with the ordination of a gay bishop and the ramification that that, ramifications that has had throughout the South. Can you explore that a little bit? What, are, what, have, what has been your experience um, as Archbishop in, in dealing with these really difficult 
disagreements, pr principally around issues of sexuality, social issues, marriage, homosexuality, et cetera? Well, I'm, I'm very aware that in this room, uh, that most people have forgotten more about this than I will probably ever know. So uh, I will speak cheerfully, <laughs> as I usually do, from ignorance. Um, I think the one of the things that strikes me, and I, I need to declare an interest, I came from a family that, on my mother's side that was involved in running bits of the British Empire for generations. So, you know, I'm one, I'm one of the bad people on this. <laughs> the... the um, um, when you talk to leaders in the Global South, whether it's politicians or, uh, or listen to people in the Global South, whether it's politicians or, or church leaders, religious leaders, and we need to remember that religion in the Global South is still the predominant feature of life. We mustn't forget that. Someone a few years ago, in an NGO, involved in NGO, said, oh, we're gonna do this. They were talking about a particular country in Sub-Saharan Africa. And they said, we're going to do this not involving religious people because they'll be biased. And I rather tactlessly said, so which telephone box are you going to meet in? <laughs> um, you know, that, that, that you can't get away from the reality of religion. But the sense with leaders that colonization has not stopped, it's merely undergone a metamorphosis, mm. a sort of uh, uh, Ovidian metamorphosis it's become, it looks like something else. Let me give you two examples. First of all, economically, um, many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, Burundi, for ex example, uh, need to develop their economy through agriculture. Yet they have immense difficulty shipping agricultural produce into Europe because of subsidies by the European Union. Um, that is a form of colonization. It keeps them in poverty, it keeps them in dependency. Um, socially, you've mentioned the issue of sexuality is one that goes intensely deeply into the way that the world is understood by all of us. It's a question of identity for many people, for almost all people. And the imposition, as it is seen in the Global South, of new approaches to what it is to be human is resented more deeply than it is possible to describe. Mm. And this isn't obscurantism. It is a sense of, hang on, you are telling us whom and what we should be. Uh, a, a senior figure in one country said to me a few years ago, he said, I didn't go through and he's an, he was an elderly man then. He said, I didn't go through the colonial period and get rid of you people in order for you to come back in a different form and do the same to me as you were doing before. Mm. And I think there's that sense that colonialism has not stopped. I'm not saying that gives us a solution, but I think we do need to be frank and to identify the problem very, very clearly. It's an economic, it's social, it's on issues like sexuality where our understanding of the nature of the human being has changed very dramatically in the post-war period. And it goes to a lot of philosophical uh, underpinning of our views of the human being, the post-modernist uh, um, move towards radical autonomy has a profound effect on the way we see our society should be structured, which does not cohere with many other countries. So, uh as the, at least the symbolic head of the Anglican communion, do you see that there is a place for church teachings? Or do church, is there no room for church teachings sort of in the <laughs> global sense? Do you have to sort of leave the definition of doctrine, therefore, to each province? No, absolutely not. Because, well, if we're going to talk pure church here, um, at the heart of Christian faith, is at the heart, at the core, is the encounter with Jesus Christ, with the risen, living, present Jesus Christ. For those who are Christians, we understand that uh, in different ways, but we meet Jesus. It is, it is all about Jesus. There isn't another way. It's not a body of doctrine in which Jesus features. It's about Jesus and the doctrine springs from the church's struggle to understand who this figure was. 
this figure understood to be um, both fully God and fully human. So when we come back to that, and when we come back to the call of Christ to serve the poor, to sacrifice, to take up his cross, to bear suffering with him, the church tends to unite, albeit struggling with issues of doctrine. But what we all struggle with, and I'm not criticizing anyone else here, it's something that I find within me as well as within the situation in which I work. We struggle with wanting our own view of how that doctrine applies to be the universal view. So no, we can't just say, well, you know, in, in England you can believe this and in Kenya you can believe that. That's not how Christian faith works. The, the, the heart of, you know, the, the, we believe that in Christ we're all one. National barriers and racial barriers and stereotypes are broken down or extinguished, dissolved. That is crucial and that's my hope and vision for the communion. My prayer for the communion is it will be a place which says, in a world of immense diversity coming at you in your face, there is hope to live together, to be a people who collaborate for the common good, serving Christ. And the, and the Anglican Communion is one of those bodies that should demonstrate that. Just to take one example, um, would you let, the, uh, it, it, I guess you have no choice, uh, but to let each province then sort of approach the issue of the role of women sort of at their own pace? Yes, um, we do. Um, and uh, at their own pace, given it took the Church of England just over 30 years from moving from saying there is no doctrinal objection to the ordination of women as bishops to the point where we ordained wish women as bishops, at your own pace is not always noticeably swift. <laughs> uh, so you have done a lot of work in <coughs> Africa, and the issue of religious violence is mm. pressing around the world, but it's hard to imagine it being any more intense than in countries like Nigeria, for example. Um, but throughout sub-Saharan Africa, tensions between Muslims and Christians uh, have turned violent in so many cases. Talk a little bit about what role you have played and what role the community has played in attempting to resolve some of these very deep issues? I think the communion, let's talk about the communion and, and uh, I'll say one or two things but, uh, about myself but try not to over-personalize it. Over the first 20 months that I was in post, I uh, managed to visit uh, with my wife all 38 provinces um, to meet the primates, not to see the whole province, that would be ridiculous, but just to meet personally with, with the primates in each province. Where, one of the things that was most striking in that, one of the common features in that, uh, was involvement in reconciliation work and mediation work. It seems to somehow be in the DNA of Anglicanism. Despite our own differences, we seem to find ourselves doing this stuff so when you go to the South Sudan, we had a particularly memorable trip to the South Sudan, both to Juba and then up to Bor, which at the time was in the middle of some very, very severe fighting. Um, bodies everywhere, and, and it was a dreadful, dreadful place of suffering. And the DRC similarly, we were there a few days later, um, Eastern DRC. The, what we found in South Sudan was the Archbishop leading the reconciliation work. Uh, we see that all over the place. So the communion, um, I know that um, Catherine Deffert Shorey, the presiding bishop here, has been very involved in this. The communion is deeply involved in reconciliation. And, and in our own struggles, we need to find a way of modeling how you do that. We will always have significant differences. That's sort of off piece, that's um, in parentheses. My own role, I think, is having some difficulty, despite my best efforts to be everywhere always, is to bless that work of reconciliation and to strengthen it and for us from Lambeth to encourage and develop local skills in reconciliation where they're facing conflict. More than half our provinces are either facing persecution 
or are in post-conflict or actual conflict? More than half. More than half. So that, is, that really is, means this is, for me, one of the key issues, because war is so, the more you see of it, and I've spent quite a lot of time doing this over quite a many years now, long before I was Archbishop, the agony that you see is beyond all description. And as, as many people here know, it sears the soul. What, so we need to be involved in that. What does that look like? I think it involves building skills uh, and building capacity in, in, in the way that you would expect. But it also involves a willingness to re-examine ourselves and our own role in conflict. Uh, the West, the economic system, um, which often generates conflict, uh, the overspill from conflicts in which we may have been involved. I think one of the striking things in northern Nigeria was, uh, has been over the years, the, the way that they've watched the Levant and Mesopotamia and um, the Holy Land and the developments there and have found either inspiration or provocation from them. Um, it's not the decisive reason. There's plenty of very local, the main reasons are local, historic, based in, in, in ethnic and, and religious features. But it contributes. And we also need to get away from simply a binary Christian-Muslim question. Um, in Myanmar, I had a call uh, when we were there. We, we were meeting bishops whose whole diocese were torn apart by fighting going on, which involved no Muslims. Uh, South India, we've seen significant pressure on, on Anglican churches and other churches there over the last 18 months, two years. Um, almost one of the most interesting socio-economic developments of the last four or five years, it seems to me, perhaps 10, is the development in all the major global faith traditions of a stream within them of radicalized violence. Now, I don't know why this is happening, but I think it bears significant research. It's something we should think more about. Why is it that so many faith traditions are seeing a radicalization of a small proportion, but a significant proportion of their adherents? What is it? that is behind that? And how is the mainstream within each faith tradition strengthened to give a narrative that challenges and subverts sufficiently the narrative of the radicalized people? I think that's a very important point, to, to, to take it out of it, because it's so, our, our preconception is so wrapped up in, in radical or extreme Islam. And you're extending that. You're saying this is a, this is a bigger problem than that. I'm saying it's global. I don't think I'm, <laughs> I'm copying other people saying it's global. I haven't had an original idea as long as I can remember. So, you know, <laughs> I'm saying it's global. I'm the Archbishop of Canterbury. I'm terribly important. You must all listen to me. <laughs> hey, you know, um, let's forget that. Um, it is global, it's generational, and it is ideological. And the use of a phrase I discovered at a meeting with some people in the armed services not long ago um, was kinetic force. I understood after a while that they meant killing people. <laughs> <laughs> and blowing things up. And blowing things up, <laughs> yeah, um, or both. And um, the use of violent force in uh, many of these conflicts may, I mean, you know, some of us here will be pacifists, others, like myself, not, may be justified, it seems to me, on a quasi um, police analogy as a way of creating space, time, safe havens, whatever. But in the end, these issues are going to be dealt with principally ideologically and theologically. And like it or not, and many people in secular government don't like it, we have got to deal with the religious mindset and get inside the religious mindset in order to have a serious impact on these, um, on these conflicts. If you look at the three most radical Islamic groups in the Levant and Mesopotamia, uh, including ISIS, Daesh, whatever you call them, 
one of the common features for them is a deep conviction that we are in the end times. This is just about the world is about to end. Well, when that's your view, it does slightly change your response to people attacking you because you haven't got a lot to lose. In fact, you've got everything to gain. And it's that narrative that needs to be subverted and shown to be false within their own ideological framework if we are going to begin to have impact on those groups. You have not always been in the church. You started out in the oil industry, and you worked in Africa. You know, I've said sorry for this many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> well, here, this is a new audience, so. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that experience and, and explain how you. Well, the oil industry. You dig holes in the ground, black stuff comes up, you flog it, you make money. <laughs> what did you learn from that? <laughs> Don't dig the holes in the wrong place, um, <laughs> which we did. Um, what did I learn from that? I think that's, I learned, well, let's say one thing in favor of the oil industry. Forgive me, but I'm going to. It's sort of probably in my bones somewhere. That, that the oil industry and, and, inter, and global, global industries are made up of people. That's the first thing. So I'm very loath to be easily condemnatory of, of large organizations, institutions, global institutions. There are, they do have their cultures. Some cultures are deeply unhealthy. Some are very healthy. I, I had the good fortune in my last company to work in one with a very healthy culture. And that was wonderful. Um, what was I, your job? I was group treasurer. I sort of looked after, I ran the money. Uh -huh. So I borrowed lots of money and <laughs> spent it. Spent it and paid some back, and then quit <laughs> before, yeah, you know, before it came back to haunt me. Um, I think um, it was a big, by by it was small by all industry standards, but large by company standards. Um, one of the other things is the important of focus, of focus and of research, of trying to find out what you're talking about before you get into it. Now, um, that's not always been one of my strengths. Um, probably still isn't, but um, I'm, I think the importance of saying when we look at a current problem, challenge, like religiously motivated violence, what are the key features of this? To what can we contribute? What short-term objectives make sense that we can make a difference to? What can we do that only we can do, because that's the only thing we should do. It's very easy in this world to sound off about, you know, um, people are bad, it'd be better if they were nice. But that doesn't get you very far. So I think one of the key things I learned was a certain pragmatism, which is probably in my nature anyway. Was there a, was there a, a, a moment when you... <coughs> Pragmatism is too easy an answer. <laughs> was there a moment where you, where you sort of, was there a moment of crisis uh, for you where, where you saw, I mean, you working in Africa, you were exposed, I'm sure, to a lot of suffering and, yeah. and you know, was there a moment Corruption. where you sort of realized you wanted to sort of do something else? No, in response um, to yes, the, um, there wasn't a moment when I wanted to do something else. There was a moment when I felt compelled that, I mean, the short answer, it, it's difficult to answer that question without sounding either flippant or hotline to Godish. Uh, but the reality is that we were at church one evening, um, my wife and I, and uh, when I was in my mid-30s, and we uh, were listening to a very good sermon, actually, by an American um, who uh, was talking about his own call to ministry, and I had a sudden, very clear sense that that's what I ought to be doing. And as we drove home, I said to her, you know, this has happened, what do you think? And so um, we spent about 18 months, two years exploring that mm -hmm. and going through the process of application. But there was a moment when it came into my mind, the longer we went on through, through the two years, the less I wanted to do it. So, I mean, I've said this before, it's quite a well-known story, but, but it bears repeating. My final interview with the bishop at a residential conference in the north of England, he said, his opening question to me was, why do you want to be ordained? And I said, I don't. 
So he looked surprised and said, what are you doing here? Which was a reasonable question. I said, mm, I can't get away from it. And he said, what will you do if we turn you down? I said, go back to London and take my wife out to the best meal I can afford to celebrate. <laughs> so um, there you are. The rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this is a fascinating conversation. And now it's your opportunity to join in this conversation, raise your own questions. I do ask you in the. Council on Foreign Relations style to uh, obviously to wait for the microphone, speak directly into it, and begin by giving your name and your affiliation. Yes, sir. You're right next to the microphone. Uh, thank you, Archbishop. Uh, I'm Jay Kansara with the Hindu American Foundation. I, uh, I appreciate your presence here today. Uh, your counterpart, uh, Pope Francis, in a trip to Latin America, apologized to the indigenous peoples for grave sins of the church in spreading their doctrine in uh, particular colonial times. What role can the Anglican church play uh, to also facilitate a dialogue on the, along those lines for some of the, uh, for some of the uh, damage done to indigenous peoples, uh, particularly in some of the places that you mentioned where there are conflicts today? I think we have to acknowledge our responsibility very clearly. Um, uh, my family, as it happens, were mainly in uh, what is now India and also what is now Pakistan. I think we have to acknowledge the failures that there were there, and the church needs to acknowledge its part in those failures and to say sorry for that. Um, we have done that, and I continue to do that and feel that, that very deeply. I think we also particularly need to acknowledge the way in which too often faith not so much followed the flag as piggybacked on the flag and was used by government and also used government to establish its power rather than to seek to challenge. There were other places where, as, as with the Catholics in Latin America, where there was an honorable defense of the powerless, but very often it was the acquisition of power. Um, and as in all institutions, there is an extraordinary mixture of the deeply wicked and the enormously heroic. You look at people like Archbishop Tutu in South Africa, and you see extraordinary hero heroism, virtue, beauty of life. Um, there were plenty of other extraordinarily bad examples. So it comes back to honesty about our history and a reality about our history. Studying, recognizing where the myths have been established and demythologizing the way we behaved. But it also comes today to listening to, in England, the Hindu Christian Forum, uh, the Muslim Christian Forum, to listening to their critique of how we are today. And we spend a lot of time doing that in England. Yes, sir. Thank you, Archbishop, very much for the time you have given us today. Uh, as you know, the, the uh, um, data shows that the, in both uh, membership and attendance at, in Anglican churches and the Church of England and the, I think the Anglican community is declining and, and significantly so. It's the same trends that we're seeing in American Catholicism and American organized religion in general. Many reasons for this, but one of the, uh, the issues that interests me is that when you look at younger people and their disconnectedness with religion, they're all having, they're actually having problems with the basic message of Christianity and the death, resurrection, salvation and, and of uh, represented uh, Jesus Christ. Against that background, uh, you and Pope Francis have a lot in common. It seems to me you're... I wish. <laughs> <laughs> no, but your fundamental uh, belief in, in, that, in, the, in the Christian message and, yes. and in Jesus Christ, you're both uh, humble, you're both very simple in the way you deliver your messages. And both of you, I mean, you have a pope who writes an encyclical uh, where he shows a pretty good grasp of chemistry. You, you write... Uh, and, and speak uh, with great uh, eloquence on uh, uh, morality and ethics and financial institutions and energy 
Uh, and you, you both have tremendous compassion for the poor. So uh, again, against that background, why don't we see more collaboration when you're both fundamentally facing the same challenge with regard to new generations and also the information age, that where younger people in particular are getting their information from, they're not getting it from going to stone churches and singing Anglican hymns, they're getting it from a lot of sources of information with, in which the, the church finds itself in competition. So uh, these are uh, pretty serious problems, it seems to me, and what a great thing it would be to see a, a kind of dream team of, uh, of you and Pope <laughs> Francis out there uh, building sentiment for uh, a, rev a, a true revival uh, of religion in the Western world. Um, I'm very cautious about putting myself in the same sentence as Pope Francis. Um, you know, this, he, is, he is a most extraordinary global leader. Most extraordinary. Um, but, uh, yes, our divisions within the church, our institutional and visible divisions, are profoundly hindering to the work of the church in the Western world, and for that matter, around the world. They are deeply damaging. Um, and I... I wish I knew the answer to that. We, the, it's a bit like, well, no, I won't use that analogy. We have been separated from Rome now since 1532 or somewhere around about there, depending on which particular bit of Henry VIII's reign you pick. And after the thick end of 500 years, separation becomes a bit of a habit. <laughs> and it's just how you think about the world. And I think our first step is to challenge that psychology of separation that has set in so deeply. Now, for instance, at Lambeth Palace, um, you know, uh, the wonderful place that I have the privilege of living in when I'm in this role in, in, in London, it's quite a big place, and a very big place indeed. And we've started a community recently, a quasi-monastic community called the Community of St. Anselm, led by a Roman Catholic, a Roman Catholic a monastic community called Chamanneuf, French origin. Um, uh, there are five of the Chamanneuf people, and there are 16 in the community of St. Anselm for 10 months, called a year in God's time. Um, and there's 23 part-time, 16 resident, 23 non-resident. These are, we had over 500 applications for those 16 places from people who've given up their jobs, their careers, paid a significant sum of money, uh, in order to work extremely hard, not have very much money at all, uh, in quite simple conditions, and spend an awful lot of time in prayer and study as well as their extremely hard work. And they're aged between 23 and 35. Um, this is not, uh, they are deeply attracted by that. I think one of the things the church has to do is stop is to say that the, the Christian life is a life of challenge in following Jesus Christ. Take up your cross and follow him. And when we don't soft pedal that, the response from younger people seems to be absolutely extraordinary. And when we say, oh, when it's all about self-valorization, whatever it happens to be, they think, oh, well, there's a million other ways I can do that that are slightly less complicated. Take up your cross, had a pretty strong message at the time of Jesus, still seems to now. But the community of St. Anselm, every single day we pray a prayer uh, that comes from the Shemanef community that we will feel the pain of our separation. And they're of all denominations. They're Anglican, they're Catholic, they're Pentecostal, whatever. And we are living the pain of that separation day by day. Every time we have a Holy Communion service, some people can't receive. Others can, depending on who's celebrating, which priest is celebrating. We have to challenge this habit of separation. I have no, there are no easy answers to it, but it's something that we cannot live comfortably with. Uh, we have to challenge, and we start with that with our social action together, which is what we're doing. It's not a very good answer, but it's the best I've got at the, time, at the moment. Yes, sir, back here in the middle. Jacob Harold with GuideStar. I, I'm wondering if there is a theology of climate change. And I, I ask this because it seems to me that climate change is a different kind of issue because of 
long-term time horizons, physical interconnection, a sense of risk. And so would you agree, is there a distinct theology of climate change? Yes. I think there very definitely is. You are talking to one of the least scientifically capable people on the face of the planet, as far as I know. Um, um, I do try and keep up with this and read up about it, but I don't pretend to any expertise at all. But theologically, yes. Um, the theology of climate change starts with God as creator. However one understands that, but God is creator. It continues with the church as, per, as existing in time and space, that the church is all Christians through time and through space, geographically and temporally. And therefore, there is a profound commitment to those. Um, uh, there is a profound overriding of the temporal horizons of our own lifetimes. And it has also within it the stewardship of creation with which humanity is entrusted. Now, those are three of the key building blocks for a theology of uh, climate change and how we deal with that. Within that, we have to apply the science. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go further down that road, but we have to apply the science. People like uh, Lord Stern, Nicholas Stern, in the UK has been extremely influential on this. There's plenty of equivalents over here. And uh, Pope Francis was profoundly advised by many people, by very many great experts in Laudato Si, his recent encyclical. Uh, but yes, there is a very clear theology which says that caring that the love for those who we don't see because they are not yet born is as important as the love for those who we do see because they're all around us. There is also a common responsibility to the most marginal people on earth, which is part of solidarity, which is a key part of both Catholic and Christian social teaching. When I talk to our primate in Melanesia uh, or in Polynesia, you know, he says, this is really quite important because actually we are literally drowning. Yes, ma'am. Elisa Massimino with Human Rights First. We uh, talked a lot today about violence, religiously motivated violence in the global south, but one of the trends that we see now is the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe mm -hmm. and anti-Semitic hatred and violence. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you're doing to help build bridges between Christians, Muslims, and Jews, and then if you have a moment, I would love to hear also about your thoughts on the role of the church in the broader communion in dealing with the refugee crisis in Europe. Thank you. I'll try and keep it very short. One, I, I discovered after the newspapers sort of started digging into my past when I was um, appointed to this role, and uh, they discovered that my father was in fact Jewish. So this, this was slightly um, a surprise, but... He'd not mentioned that. Uh, he, di he died in the 1970s, and um, yeah, there you are. So, so this, is, this is something I feel. Uh, and, and they came, they, his family fled from Germany before the Great War, foreseeing trouble very wisely. But some didn't and suffered the consequences. But that's a sort of declaration of interest, really. OK, in terms of um, the rise of anti Semitism, Anti-Semitism, I don't think there's a rise of anti-Semitism. I think there's a re-emergence of a late, latent anti-Semitism that is deeply embedded in European culture and always has been. I don't think there's new people becoming anti-Semitic who were previously not anti-Semitic. Thank you. Um, I think that there is this sense that, that has existed in Europe that emerges catastrophically from time to time. Uh, it is very powerful. What are we doing? Um, uh, we're doing some of the sort of public stuff, symbolic stuff, which goes, which I think is important of making statements. So we had the All Party Parliamentary Group's report on anti-Semitism. We hosted the launch of a major report earlier this year at Lambeth Palace, and that got a lot of attention. It was three weeks before the election, a number of top politicians came to that, despite the fact that they had other things on their mind, and from right across the political spectrum. Um, we are very tough where we find anti-Semitism within our own clergy, and our, um, we, we, we are very, very straightforward with that. Um, the communion, 
So it is a challenge, and I think we need to keep speaking about it. It's one of those challenges that you can never take for granted. Um, and we have to remember that in Europe, I'm not saying the United States, in Europe, we have very little moral standing when it comes to dealing with anti-Semitism. Our history is too bad and too long to have, we need always to speak with great humility. Secondly, the issue around the refugees. Uh, the uh, Church of England bishops are working, have, we've been working very hard with the government. Uh, I've spoken in the House of Lords. Uh, one of the strange things about this job is I sit in Parliament and was very involved in the debate on how many refugees we took. And we've been having very um, clear discussions with the government on, on the numbers that should be taken. Um, around the world, the Anglican Communion has been less impacted because it's, on the whole, it's our biggest parts of the Anglican Communion are in the places from which refugees are coming, not to which they're going. Mm. Uh, uh, Europe, there is a friend of mine, actually, an old friend of mine called the Bishop in Europe. Um, we don't call him the Bishop of Europe because we've already got one of those in Rome. And um, it would seem a little presumptuous. And the bishop in Europe, um, we have chaplaincies across Europe, three, four hundred churches across Europe. Our chaplaincies in, East, in Athens and places like that, Bucharest, uh, have been working unbelievably hard on the ground in uh, meeting the needs of the refugees appearing. Um, as the communion, this is an area, there are now, according to UN figures a few weeks ago, 59.7 million UNHCR said 59.7 million refugees in the world. It's not only in Europe. And in the communion, when we meet as primates, uh, that may well be one of the issues we discuss because places like Tanzania, Congo, Burundi, Rwanda, Uganda, the Great Lakes generally, West Africa, um, have numbers of refugees that are far greater than those coming into Europe who are entirely forgotten and perhaps one of our roles is to remind people of the poorest of the poor, whose struggle and suffering is beyond all description, even compared to the appalling situation of refugees on the borders of and coming into Europe. What are these primates telling you about the, about the conditions that drive their people to leave? A lot. Um, oh. It's nothing surprising. It's war, it's poverty, uh, it's inequality of opportunity, it's persecution, um, which the US government, of course, is particularly good on confronting. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's also societal breakdown in other ways. There is a growing trend of breakdown of families, which leaves children and uh, as always, above all, single women, uh, immensely vulnerable. Uh, modern trafficking, the trafficking of, of slaves uh, affecting over 30 million people uh, is a major driver, particularly uh, in, in, in uh, women being trafficked into being sex workers. Uh, I was meeting a charity last Thursday, uh, not far from London, extraordinary bunch of young women uh, who were called by God very clearly about seven or eight years ago. They just operate off no money at all. They, their budget is less than a thousand pounds, fifteen hundred dollars a month for all of them. Only one of them gets any pay at all. And they work with <coughs> sex workers in that particular area. They reckon 85 percent of the people they work with have been trafficked. 85 percent. It's very, very rare to find someone who was not trafficked. And their work is to try and, first of all, give them a sense of their human dignity, and secondly, then practically to try and find ways forward. What is driving this is all the things that have always driven it. But given that we now know about it, we have no excuse for not responding to it. Yes, sir. Dane Smith, <clears throat> what suggestions, Archbishop, do you have for religious leaders and lay people 
uh, in promoting uh, Christian-Muslim dialogue and reconciliation. Challenge stereotypes. We have to start with challenging stereotypes. We have to start with actually sitting down and meeting people. We're doing a lot of that, both with lay leaders and with um, ordained uh, from within the Christian community. Take risks. We have to be willing to talk to people who are not always the kind of people we want to talk to. I'm trying to put this rather tactfully. I don't mean, I'm not talking about Daesh here or, or the jihadist extremists, but I am saying that it is no, no use saying we'll only talk to the nice people. It's not the nice people that are causing the problems. They're often the victims. We have to work our way towards an honest discussion that doesn't start with a syncretistic, we all really agree with each other, don't we, so let's be nice, which is you know, what I used to say to my children when they were small and had about as much impact then, for that matter. Um, but we, we need to work away from that towards a real integrity that says, here are our differences, here is our fundamental, here are the fundamental issues that cause us to differ. We think we are right, you think you're right, that gives a different worldview, a different approach to the human being, a different po approach particularly um, to how you deal with people on the edge, people outside your faith community. We need much more integrity of dialogue. But to do that, you must form relationships. You must form relationships with people whose views may be exceptionally challenging and uncomfortable. We have to take some risks doing that and not be naive that we're just dealing with nice people with whom we can all have nice conversations. I don't think that helps. Um, I mean, I could go on for hours on this. It's a passion of mine. But the best work that I've seen, or for that matter, been involved in, has been when we got to the point where we're able to say, we disagree with you profoundly on this. How do we transform this profound disagreement from violent to nonviolent? Are you having any of these discussions with, in, in England with uh, yes. Muslim leaders? And yes, constantly. Yes, sir. My name is Tom Getman. I'm an NGO executive and professional board member. <laughs> Your grace, thank you. Um, we, as you know, have a daughter who is an Anglican priest. And she said one of the things that she appreciates is your evangelical spirit. In this country, um, evangelicalism is a dirty word for many people, misunderstood, uh, misdefined. And uh, those of us that are evangelical sometimes find ourselves struggling to explain what it really means. How do you define evangelical and what would you oh. say to instruct um, people in the media here who use it wrong, wrongly. Thank you. <laughs> that is a really seriously difficult question. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that one. Um, for what it's worth, my definition of, I would consider, my, I'm not a great party person. Uh, I don't mean, I love parties. I don't mean, um, you know, I love jolly parties. I just don't join groups very easily. Um, I consider, yes, uh, I consider myself evangelical. Not all evangelicals agree with that, I think it would be fair to say. Um, I would define as evangelical as someone for whom the final authority in belief and practice is found in scripture properly interpreted. That covers the difficult bit. So that's where I come from. It has nothing to do with your politics. You can, I know evangelicals on the left in England and on the right. Um, I agree with some, I disagree with some. Um, I, I, there's, I agree with some of the things that some say on both sides and disagree with some of the things that some say on both sides. 
It is not about your attitude to guns, um, um, the nuclear deterrent, uh, or social rights. Uh, it is about where you find authority in your life, in your creeds, and in your behavior. It's a rather shorthand definition, but if you don't mind, I'll probably leave it there. Yes, sir. Good morning, uh, Emery Chilik, Rumi Forum. I'm wondering, going off your previous answer, how we can move uh, interfaith dialogue into a social movement beyond the uh, dialogue industry and the, and the nice people that you refer to? I think we have to be real and say you can't do everything in public. Um, there's moments for symbolic get-togethers of, you know, what in England we call slightly ironically the great and the good. And there are moments when you have to operate below the radar, meeting people quietly where in safe spaces. The most difficult thing I think we find and that we struggle with, and David Porter, my director of reconciliation, is sitting just down, down here, uh, who is the expert on this, is how do we create safe space for people to get to the point that they say what they really think. It's unbelievably difficult. Um, they all, everyone will be worried that it'll be in the media or their friends will find out, they'll be threatened. I've had a religious leader from another faith tradition overseas ringing me not long ago at 11.15 at night saying I've just had my third death threat of the day. I just can't go on with this. We need to realize that people take huge risks doing that. And we need to take risks. But part of the risk is being willing to create safe space and not be seen to be doing what we are doing. Part of, our, of this, the world in your hand problem is that unless you're seen to say something or do something, clearly you don't care, which is, of course, rubbish. But, um, for those who have, uh, were at the Council of Foreign Relations, I presume there's quite a few diplomats here, you will know the problem. You know, you, you can't say everything you're doing. So it means backstairs, below the radar, the risk of being deeply misunderstood. It means you have to be politically slightly canny. That's an English word. <laughs> In, yes, sir, back there, yeah. Good morning, Bill Aiken from the uh, Soka Gakkai Buddhist community. Mm. Uh, thanks very much for taking the time with us today. I, I'm wondering if you could go a little bit further into, it, you've been discussing the issues of dialogue and sometimes difficult dialogue. And I imagine some of your most challenging dialogue is within the communion, within the Anglican mm. communion. And we talked earlier about ideological colonialization. And I'm, but I'm sure that that comes face to face with sometimes fundamental senses of human mm. dignity and morality mm. and ethics. And I'm wondering if you could just give us a little more light into your process and how you've been engaging this and dealing with issues which you may have to walk that line between not wanting to be an ideological colonial, but having some moral um, speaking truth, I guess, in, in those difficult moments, uh, whether it's the issue. I'm not talking about gender issues regarding mm. positions in the church, but I'm talking about fundamental treatment, whether it's genital mutilation, care of girls, mm. et cetera. Could you give us a little bit more um, insight into your struggles with that? The struggle, the main struggle is getting very isolated. You've got to meet people. Um, after I met these people in these sex workers I was talking about a few moments ago, the next day some, one of them tweeted a most lovely picture saying that they'd met me. And it was just a lovely message. And one of my, uh, uh, my family came in and found me in floods of tears in the kitchen um, because I was so moved that by this. You have to let your heart be broken. You can't be too professionalized about this in the wrong sense. You've got to be highly professional. But you've got to let your heart be broken by encountering 
people where they are. And the danger of this role is you spend your life in a little bubble of everyone treating you grandly. Um, and, and you don't get out and away from all the folder roll and let your heart be broken by the plight of the people you meet. And that will come in a number of ways. So I, I can still remember an agonizing. I find this, you, you've touched on a point which for me is a point of immense personal pain as how one holds truth and compassion together in public discourse. And, and I spend my time asking myself, telling myself I've got it wrong. But I remember a conversation a few years, quite a few years back, um, in sub-Saharan Africa with some people on the issue of human sexuality. We differed very deeply on it. But as I listened to them, I sense their anxiety, their, their, their sense of betrayal in what I was saying. And you have to let yourself be touched by that. You can't just reject it as an ignorant view. You have to let it hurt. So I think part of the dialogue that we need is a dialogue that involves great pain. We must let ourselves be hurt. And I struggle with it because I, like all of us, I don't like being hurt. I don't like the pain. I will go a long way to avoid it, emotional pain particularly. Does that make any sense? Very much. I'm afraid we're going to have to um, close it down now. The Archbishop uh, is going to have to be leaving. But I do want to ask you for one final thought, sir. Um, we've been talking about a lot of issues here, climate change, migration, violence that are handled by secular institutions. Yeah. Do you see uh, any challenge for the, ch any danger in the church becoming too secularized by its focus on these, on these institutions? Because Ooh, several other question. things you mentioned I think are very important. The, the importance of not soft peddling your faith. Uh, yes, I think there is. I think um, in a bid for favor and for making people like us, we can end up wanting to say the right thing about everything. Uh, we are called as Christians, I speak only for myself, but, or for Christ, you know, for, uh, as a Christian, I'm called to be someone, uh, the scripture, the Bible, the words of Jesus teach me to believe that for someone to become a disciple of Jesus Christ is the best decision that they can ever make in their life. And therefore, the heart of what I have to do, even at interviews like this or uh, on the BBC, or whatever it has to be, happens to be, or ITP, whatever, I, I need to say that. And not to become what Pope Francis, another of his brilliant phrases, calls a practical atheist. In other words, you believe in God, but you seek all the secular solutions. Right. In the end, it's all about Jesus. I said that earlier, I think. <laughs> Very good. All right, thank you so much, Archbishop. A couple of reminders. Uh, <clears throat> I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but this has been an on-the-record event. I'd like to thank the Council on Foreign Relations, and in particular, co-sponsor of the Council's Religion and Foreign Policy Initiative. Uh, the Archbishop has to take off very quickly now, so if you could give him the courtesy of remaining seated while he takes off. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much.